Okay, so we're back. Hopefully I didn't lose too much there. But what we have here, uh, just recapping in case a little bit of the lecture got lost. The basic task, the search query comes in, Google processes it. We assume they're holding that result locally, right? The results matching the search query. If not, then we'll talk about that in a second. But if they do, they parse the search query and extract any semantic units. In this case, it's one word, so there's not much to extract. Uh, finds which servers within its tens of thousands of servers there have the matching uh, index entries, right? And ideally, it's not stored on a very large cluster of servers. It's just stored on a few machines. Then, pulls the index entries, right? So there might be 100,000 or 100 million pages containing Galileo. Compares them all to find which is the best match, and then returns that short list of matches to the user. Now, in the case of where a page isn't stored locally, for example, if you have a U.S. person in Japan that uses Google in Japan to find some information about New York, let's assume that information is not stored locally in Japan. So what happens is even though Japan's data center doesn't hold those pages, it will basically, for that index entry, says we don't have this index entry, it's in New York, if you want to get the pages, talk to them. So the request will go up through uh, Silicon Valley, which is you know the headquarters, so that's the hub of where things go through. Gets passed along to New York. New York figures out which pages match, returns a subset of them, and those that subset gets returned to the uh, Japan data center. Okay? And over time, if enough requests for that kind of information come through, then the Japanese data center will start holding that uh, holding those pages as well, that index entry. Okay. So now I'm going to pull that and hopefully not lose recording again. Okay. Okay. So, we know Google stores a replica of each page, right? Basically a triple copy of everything. So for every page at Spiders visit, it basically stores a duplicate surface web. So spiders are always out there looking at all the pages on the surface web. That's a lot of pages, right? Okay. So localization, number one. Any data center is going to store pages that Google thinks are going to be of local, better local interest. Uh, anything that local places, local people, local language text. In fact, language is generally the primary driver of where things get stored because it tends to be pretty highly correlated with geography. Okay? Other things, right? Some queries basically are just going to mean for this location. Just like we talked about weather or local events, if you Google those for weather, you're automatically going to get today's weather, but you're also going to get today's local weather. So if I just go to Google right now from Chicago, and I Google weather, I'm going to get in my own zip code, right? Near West Side. That's where we are. Okay. If I'm in some other city, if I'm in New York or whatever, uh, Orlando, if I'm at uh, Disney World, then I'll get their local weather. Okay. And as necessary, non-local pages can be retrieved from other databases, uh, data centers. Similarly to Facebook, remember Facebook had to deal with this long tail problem with its pictures, right? It was getting a lot of requests for pictures, even though those pictures were a couple years old. So it, Facebook basically couldn't just store them all in a digital closet and figure, well, nobody's really going to come look at these very often, so we can be really slow. Enough people look at those oddball things often enough where those have to have good performance too. So Google has this kind of long tail popularity problem as well. So sure, majority of searches are for current events, current things going on but a substantial minority are for years old pages, right? Also, there's a lot of novelty in uh, Google. So 2013, the last year I have for this kind of stat, in 2013, Google said that 16% of its searches were first time searches. And the way they knew that is when a search came in, they didn't have an index entry for that search. So they said, yeah, we don't have any background information on what people are looking for here. And you can imagine my, my best guess for why, they didn't really talk about it, my best guess for why is they're simply unique combinations of people's names and other things, right? So if people are, for example, if I'm looking for myself, Doug Lundquist and blah, 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 so if I'm Googling myself, uh, or if I'm Googling information about some other person in some different context, and there are always new people rising to the top of whatever situation or new actions going on. So like Elon Musk, right? People might be searching for him as far as Tesla, or then for his appearance on Big Bang, or then for him smoking a doobie during a you know a phone interview, things like that, during a conference call. Yeah, first time searches, a lot of that stuff, current events happen. Okay, anyway, 
Conclusion for that, Google can optimize its performance by constantly updating and caching popular search results. So if Google recognizes, ah, this thing is a suddenly new popular search, right? Some big, what's the current event for today? Let's see, I hope it's not something horrible, but they often are. What do we get? Come on, give me some of this is just links to current events, you bastards. All right, current event Chicago. Give me something. I just look Chicago breaking news. Let's see what we get. Ugh. All right, so those are just the links. All right. Oh, yeah. Well, it's usually something bad, right? All right. Okay. So it finds a search as popular, it caches the results. But still, older, less popular pages, just like Facebook, can't ignore them. Still has to have pretty good performance on those things. For example, what's something? Let's try to pull up something from 1998. Uh, let's see. Stuff from 1998 Chicago. Let's see what we get. Ugh. No. We're getting current pages today. Well, the one that I can get is uh, Origins. Java Embedded Computing, 1995. Used to be a very old article about this. Yeah. It gets harder and harder to find older stuff. That's right, not really that worried about it. Okay. People don't look at them, they stop showing up in the search results. Okay. Anyway, talking about how task division works. So when Google gets a search query, right, and the system determines that it's handled locally, that brings us back to our picture. First of all, Google's going to check if the search results are already available for prior searches, right? So first step, caching, okay? And that can happen immediately. So once Google says, oh, I'm going to process this. I can just pass it on to a separate system and see if their results are already cached for that, right? And then I don't have to go through this whole process. I say, did somebody just send in that same search query a second ago and I already did the work on it? If so, right, as popular enough, I have the results there, okay? If not, then the search has to get processed from scratch, right? If you don't have the uh, data there, the search results are already there, then you got to process it. So, parsing the index terms, retrieve the matching page, do the ranking, and deliver the results. Right, we've already talked about that. So, what happens? Well, you know what? I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and do this. So, first of all, this is the parsing. Google doesn't actually talk in precise detail about what happens. But one of the places where you can look for a little bit about what they do is its patent documents. Now, they tend to be pretty hard to read, pretty jargon-heavy. Unless you, like, have advanced degrees in computer science, they can be a little bit of a hassle to read. But we're going to try it anyway. I'm going to briefly look at this patent document here. Okay. So query scheduling using hierarchical tiers of index servers. Now, I'm not going to make you, like, suffer through this whole thing. But I just want to show you a little bit of how it works. So it's a fairly long thing. Uh, okay. And a lot of this is preamble, basically describing their invention. But here's the example here. This is a good one. So, for example, you have somebody searching for New York restaurants, right? There are a number of possible ways they could be ordered. It could be all as separate words. It could be a two-in-one grouping, it could be a one-in-two grouping, it could be a group of all three, right? And for more search terms, then there are more possibilities. Google basically has to look at, are these all separate semantic units? Well, chances are, if somebody Googles the terms, right, New York restaurants, what are they probably looking for? Probably. What, is, what are the semantic groupings here? What words go together? Probably, 
And what do we mean by New York in this context, probably? Probably the city and not the state, right? Probably. I would venture, you know, I would feel pretty confident in saying Google probably has data to back up that this is the grouping that makes sense. And implicitly, New York City restaurants, not New York State restaurants, even though any, any restaurant in New York City is in New York State, but you get the idea, okay? So here we have a little bit of semantic fuzziness already, but this is the sort of problem they're talking about. How does Google learn? Well, the short version, Google learns through experience, right? If there are pages that say, you know, best restaurants in New York City, and another page that says, best restaurants in New York State, and people are skipping over the state one and clicking on the city one, Google knows that New York tends to mean the city unless people specifically say New York State. Okay. Now going down a little further here, and then by a little further, I mean a lot further. This is a rather painfully long document. Okay. Mm. This too, okay? So imagine if you have a simple sentence, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, right? That is some kind of typo there. Uh, you can break that up into any number of ways, right? You compare it, the number of possibilities, gets very large for that. So Google needs a fairly efficient way to say, okay, I'm gonna look and see which of these combinations actually ever come up. Google's not gonna check every possible combination of those because that's a lot of time for very little return. Google's going to try to learn which of these phrases often occur together. Okay, and that's what they're talking about here. Anything else? Yeah. So, for example, there's a scoring system, right? So looking at different sequences that might appear. And if a different sequence appear, it basically says, oh, this occurs once, it occurs in the regular text, and all five words, and it starts off a sentence, right? Here it's in the middle, here's it at the end, here's an exact match. Google describes how the text occurs on the page and the strength of the match somehow. And all those, there's a set of points that are added up. And over time, you know, Google does that and says, okay, this phrase matches very well with this page, not so well with this other page. That's the basis for their ranking system. Okay. So again, a lot of work to get to that point, but this is uh, essentially how it works. And I do not recommend that you try to read that whole thing. The short version is Google spends a fair amount of effort in trying to figure out which search phrase groupings have the most impact, and it only compares those. Okay. Okay, so back to where we were. Eh, we'll cover these other two, and then we'll go ahead. Okay. So once we get into the actual matching process, right, so we've got this query, we've parsed it, now we want to retrieve the pages. Well, where are the pages? Well, first, they're in index entries, so there's two ways that Google's going to look. It's going to look for exact or nearly exact semantic matches, and it's going to check for likely alternate means, right? Basically through spelling service. For example, if somebody enters in a typo, like instead of looking for Galileo, maybe somebody does a typo and does Galileo, right? And it takes a minute, ooh, 0.85 seconds. But yeah, the spelling service says, you know what, we don't really have stuff for Galileo. But we got a lot of Galileo, maybe that's what you're looking for. All right, we'll talk about the mechanics behind that as well. Now, if you're interested, I have here a very early page uh, paper about Google, back when it was called, a uh, system called Backrub, okay? Just to give you an idea of what the scale was back then. Prototype with full text and hyperlink database, 24 million pages available at Stanford there. Anyway, these were the two guys that, you know, were the core of Google. Uh, Sergey Brin, Lawrence Page, Larry Page. Anyway, they talk about it. Uh, just to give you an idea of how much faster it is now, they have some, they have some contact uh, performance numbers here. In a second, this is much more readable, by the way. Uh, here we go. So, for 
for the initial query, they're always going to be slower, first time a query comes in. If it's the same query repeated, right, chances are a lot of the work has already been done and is cached somewhere. So Al Gore, who was a uh, notable in the 90s, the initial query took a fraction, uh, total time two seconds, but if it gets a cached version, tiny fraction of a second, right, 0 0.06, like a sixteenth of a second. Vice President, right, in their version it took almost four seconds, but the cached version was less than half. Why? There's a lot more entries for Vice President than there are for Al Gore, okay? And especially, remember this, 1998, they were exact text matches, so it had to actually match Al Gore. It couldn't be Albert Gore, for example. Okay. Hard disks, this one took a little longer, but the caching was much smaller, uh, much faster. Search engines, you know, that one took almost 10 seconds. I'm not sure why, it's been a long time since I read this paper, but yeah. Basically, this is an idea of how long the initial searches take, and typically sped up by about a factor of 10 or more for cached searches. Much, much faster. So once Google recognizes that a search is popular, it's going to cache those results, and it's going to be able to deliver them relatively instantly. Okay, so this is where they were 20 years ago. Okay. So... For index servers, first of all, grouped into clusters divided by language. Even within one data center, might contain content in many languages. For example, English and Spanish are both widely used in the U.S. Uh, over in Europe, right, you can often have uh, like five or ten languages within a 100-mile radius. It's not a big thing. Uh, and some languages that over here we consider all the same still have, you know, very different dialects, like Chinese and Indian, for example, or Hindi. Uh, so very, very different. Anyway. Each of, those, uh, each of those different languages so can have many search terms. So for English, several hundred thousand search terms, each of those many millions of pages. And the index gets divided over many servers, right? If you have many, many millions of pages, each one of those has some reference number, some page title that they can get to it. To store millions of those pages is going to be a huge amount of data. You're not going to keep all that on one server. You might keep one index entry on one server, but you're certainly not going to keep Google's entire index on one machine. It's going to be stored on many thousands of servers. Okay? All right. Any, chances are any query not in the local language will probably be forwarded to a different cluster. So if it's in one of the languages you have locally, yeah, there's a pretty good chance that uh, page is already there to match that query. Okay. So when a search query gets received, what happens? Well, first, again, semantic analysis to identify which index has the search terms and then forwards the query to the appropriate servers. That's where we get to this. Okay, so this is the page we already covered a minute ago. Uh, we'll talk about the detail. So the detail on how the servers are arranged, okay, there's some math behind this that we don't get into, but the short version, server cluster gets divided into segments. Each phrase entry is confined to a single segment. All right. So what we have is something like this. For example, if I am looking for Galileo, and I'll use his full name, Galilei, okay, then there could be two separate indexes. There could be one for Galilei and another one for Galileo. And we'll assume for the moment that they're stored separately and they're not you know, part of the same semantic unit. Okay. There might be two different ones, even though there's obviously going to be a lot of overlap. So for Galileo, it's stored on one set of servers. For Galilei, it's stored on another set of servers. Okay. So the first perk about this is these two parts of the search operation, right? the matching operation, they can happen in parallel because I retrieve these pages from these servers, I retrieve these pages from these servers. Now, if they're all stored together, of course, that makes it even simpler. Okay, but we'll assume they're all stored differently. Now, the next thing, well, how does this whole entry list get divided, and how are the pages uh, stored? Well, like this. So, within any cluster, right, the index gets divided into n sections and gets assigned to server tier. So, basically, the whole big index, whatever's stored at that data center, they make up into n slices. Each one of those slices gets assigned to a different tier of servers. And a tier, remember, is just a group of servers doing the same thing. So each slice has a dedicated group of servers dedicated to working with that slice of the index. 
each index entry is distributed over one or more shards, so part of the tier. So a particular machine or portion of a machine, it gets scattered over that. And tends to be shattered, uh, scattered over separate servers to enhance parallel operations. Basically, the initial pass Passing the index entry along to a tier, you don't want every tier to be involved in every index, but every index retrieval. But when you're processing that, when you're saying which pages actually correspond to that index entry, you want a lot of machines within a tier to do it so it gets processed quickly. Okay? Now the neat thing about this, there's an assignment function. This is where the math comes in. Any given page gets stored in the same shard for any entry, including the page, right? So that means this. If there is, I'm going to just pull this image. If there is a page, some page... about Galileo, say, okay? Page gets stored in the same shard for any entry, including the page. So every copy of that page, right, just the data about it, will get stored in the same shard. So if it's stored in number one, it gets stored there, it gets stored there, it gets stored there, it gets stored there. For all the tiers that are involved in it, that page gets referenced through all these. And again, the nice thing about this is it enhances parallel operation. Basically, if a request goes through and it has to search for that, it's going to use these same uh, shards in every tier that's involved in the process. Okay? That means that the rest of the system, you can plan around it better. You can say, well, yeah, this shard is busy right now, but the next one that comes in, it might use number two or the last one, whatever. Now, in this diagram, every server tier has the same number of shards, M, but it's not required, right? Some tiers might have a larger number of shards than others. Just the point is, if a page is referenced across more than one tier, it's all stored in the same shard, and that makes it pretty easy to plan. It makes it pretty easy to plan because you know that once a request comes in, it's only gonna occupy the same space in each tier. All right, now that's a little bit more detail, you know, like network and system architecture. I'm not going to ask you about that really on the exam. I'm just giving you some context about how Google works. Okay. And if you're an, you know, an IT person, if you're an IDS major, you may find that interesting. A little extra there. Okay. So we understand it gets the pages, right? It gets the terms. It figures out what index entries correspond. It looks up the pages corresponding to those uh, index entries. Now, how does it do the comparison process? Well, sure, Google stores the original page document data and stores it somewhere, right? Uh, but this creates problems. If you're going to just go by those original documents, number one, it's hard to compare them. It's hard to do some kind of apples and oranges comparison, right? Google, sure, it stores all the pages, and sometimes it tweaks its algorithm to see which works better, uh, which version works better. And to do that, yeah, it needs the original data. But all that is on separate hardware. The original copies of all the pages, they're stored somewhere else in Google. They're not really part of this indexing and retrieval system. Instead, what happens when the query comes in, Google uses this pre-made data. So for every page, it extracts the key variables that are involved in the ranking process, and it stores them, okay? Now, because each one of those, basically for every page, mention this, Since every page uh, has the same kind of data extracted and distilled for Google's ranking algorithm, it can be stored in a relatively fast relational database. Okay. So the relational databases are faster, and they still apply some special structuring there. But it's fast because you know every page is going to have the same kind of stuff, and it's very easy to see that. If it just stored it in a big blob of data, said, oh, here's this web page, then every time a search process came through, right, Google would have to look at the page, 
redistill every re-extract all that meaningful data from the algorithm from it. That would be crazy. Instead, Google just takes the page, takes the data from the page that it's going to use and stores that. And that's what this process is based on. Okay. Now again, there's hundred literally hundreds of variables involved, but still it's much faster than trying to uh, reanalyze the entire page. Excuse me. Okay. So we know this. When the query gets processed, uh, the indexing system retrieves the matching documents. Users get a blurb of text, right? Typically a title and a few lines of text. And then there's layered rounds of page ranking. First of all, you get like the best results, and then, right, then subsequently you get less results. So initially, the matching is done by search term match strength, right? Basically where the terms are, where they appear in the documents, all that. And then afterward, by analyzing the document itself, right? So look at all the key data in the document. So the first pass is say, which of these documents actually hold the terms, right? Because that's gonna filter which ones you look at at all. And once you have this subset of documents that you're actually going to look at, then you look at the individual document data. Okay. Now, as far as anybody on the outside knows, Google does use a common methodology for this page analysis. Basically, they store the same kind of data for every page. In this, what they do, they reduce this page content to a set of variables. First of all, the title and uh, maybe a blurb below if necessary, and then hundreds of other factors like images it's stored, how recently the page was refreshed, uh, the site that the page belongs to, who wrote the page, anything like that, the uh, initial language of it. And basically there's a uniform structure, so it's compatible with relational database models. Now, yeah, Google does store these documents in their original form, right? And the main reason for that is to reanalyze algorithms and maybe do checks to make sure that the documents still match up with what Google has in its other system. And there's, since there's no inherent structure to pages themselves, some no, kind of NoSQL uh, is a sensible option. But in fact, Google for its, uh, this one, for its uh, basic distilled data, Google do, does something called Bigtable, okay? And Bigtable, it has elements of it that are relational, but also elements that are a little different. So, key thing, every object, right, in its big table is stored as, uh, number one, relevant page data plus a timestamp. And the reason why it needs a timestamp is Google wants to track, you know, which version of the page it's using. So there's always a field for that. But sparsely, sparsely populated tables of rows and columns, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so first thing, in Bigtable, one of the key principles is groups of related rows get stored near each other, so queries don't search the whole database, okay? And the idea for that is just this. Imagine if Google has some giant, giant, giant table, I'll call it very big table. Okay. And suppose that in this very big table, however the pages are stored, only a subset of these at a time is probably involved with a particular query. Okay? Well, that's nice. If I store them next to each other, then I can just figure out what the starting point is, what the end point is, and just scan through that portion of a table. And maybe even all these portions, portions are all on different servers, and they can be all processed separately. Okay? If they were all randomly distributed through all of this uh, big table, then I would have to, for every query, I'd have to start at the beginning and go through all of them. It'd be a lot more work. So if there are pages that commonly come up and they're grouped together somehow, for example, they're involved in recent popular searches, yeah, Google's going to try to arrange them together. Okay, or of course, the other thing is, yeah, obviously, if they're involved in the same searches, right, if they share uh, common search terms, then they're going to be arranged that way, too. Okay. I should also, I'll mention one more thing. Imagine, imagine this. So we have some, uh, I'm going to, I have three sets of search terms, right? Imagine if I have Chicago, Cubs, and no, I need three, three search terms that often come up together. Sure. Chicago Cubs is a thing, but uh, baseball, oh, what can I go with that? It's another word that goes with, oh, uh, park. Okay.
These things are conceivably all related, but they're related in different ways, right? I can look for Chicago Cubs by itself without baseball and park. I might group all those pages together. I could certainly look at Chicago Cubs and baseball, right? Better yet, let's do, uh, instead of park, let's do Wrigley, okay? Chicago Cubs baseball Wrigley. These are ones that are, you know, three semantic units, and they could come up together often, right? Sometimes people search Chicago Cubs Wrigley or baseball Wrigley or Chicago Cubs baseball. And since I'm storing a triple copy, I can store these pages in different combinations. I could have one table keeping Chicago Cubs and baseball together, okay? One keeping Chicago Cubs and Wrigley together. And one keeping baseball and Wrigley together. Okay? And all of those could be searched differently. So if a query comes in that just involves these two, I can direct it to the copy of the table that has these pages close together. If a query comes in that has Chicago Cubs and Wrigley, I could direct it to the table that has those close together. If this one comes in, I can direct it to a third table. I'm still meeting the requirement of storing a triple copy, but the different copies I have, I can index in different ways to make them easier to retrieve. <laughs> okay. Again, a little more detail, but that's the idea, the, the sort of... Uh, you know, if, if you don't tie yourself to needing to store everything in the exact same way in every table, you have that kind of flexibility. Okay, so groups of related rows get stored together so queries don't search the whole database. And again, there's potentially flexibility in there and popular search terms paired together. Now, we also have something called column families. Now, remember, in a regular access data table, every column pointed, you know, referenced one particular thing. But we know with web pages, you often have a lot of the same type of thing. For example, you might have a page that has 60 or 100 images, or you might have a page that has a dozen links to different pages, anything like that, or a bunch of different headers. It makes sense to not be tied into, you know, a particular number of things. So in this case, in Bigtable, you recognize that you will have column families. So there'll be like one column for images, but that images entry will point to a list of all the images, right? And for example, if you have a list of links, you'll have one entry for links, and that will point to, again, a list of links. So that's what a column family is. Instead of saying that every column is going to be one particular thing, in Bigtable, every column could potentially reference a group of the same kind of things. The other bit, sparsely populated. So you know, given that Google takes literally hundreds of different types of data about a web page, Many pages are not going to have that kind of data. For example, many pages may not link to other pages, or they might not have images, or they certainly might not all have videos, anything like that. So for those columns that are empty, remember in a re standard relational database, if those columns are empty, you still have to keep that data. You know, it just gets packed with zeros and it's wasted space. In Google's big table operation, if the columns are empty, basically there's a quick way of saying, yeah, you know what, this thing, this thing is just not here and we're going to save space on that. It's a little slower to search through, but it's not so much slower that it uh, outweighs the need for saving storage space. Because when you're keeping a triple copy of the internet, right, you really need to worry about those kind of space problems. Okay, so those are the key features of Bigtable. Number one, right, every record has a timestamp. Number two, Column families, so unlike a regular relational database where every column is one thing, in Bigtable it points to a potentially a group of things. And it's sparsely populated, which just means if there's a lot of empty space in the table, you're not going to waste a lot of space on your storage media. Okay. All right. Last real topic here. I guess I've been, I've been talking for a while. Any questions about any of this stuff? I mean, I imagine some people must have some questions, but nobody wants to talk. No questions? <laughs> All right. So the last thing to talk about here, spelling servers. I'm just going to make sure the recording is still on. It is good. Okay. Okay. So we 
all know that sometimes when you're making a search on Google, you enter in the wrong stuff, right? That happens. So how does it work? Well, basically, first of all, the original search query comes in. First of all, Google's going to check and see, oh, is anything gone wrong with that? How does it do it? Well, it identifies misspellings by comparing query ranks, okay? And then it returns a list of likely options. So, how does it work? Well, basically, it looks for something that's higher frequency and rarely changed. So, what that means is this, you know. How to recognize a spelling error. Okay, first, it's an unusual spelling, right? Basically means, ideally, with no index entry. So that's one thing. Spelling errors are pretty rare for most things. I mean, you can have exceptions like, uh, right, there are some even more than, say, separate, right, very common spelling mistake. But if it's an unusual spelling like, like separate, right, if I just put in a double P there for no good reason, oh, Google's going to say, yeah, we don't have an index entry for that. So unusual spelling. Second, very similar to a common word, okay? And Google's going to look and say, you know what, this odd word that you put in there, I don't really have much data on this one, suggesting that it's either really rare or a misspelling. But if it's also very similar to a common word, statistically, it's more likely that you have misspelled the common word than you've entered in something different intentionally. Okay, so compare. All right, and that, that's essentially it. So. Spelling error, uh, spelling check has been around for about 10 years. And again, sometimes it's an actual definite entry like search term with no index entry. But sometimes, right, people enter in correct but unusual words that are very similar to popular search terms. And I'm sure we've all experienced that where we typed in some oddball word into Google and it's definitely the word we mean to use. But then Google says, are you sure you didn't mean this? So, how it works? Well, first of all, Higher frequency, right? So if the query is a common query and it's rarely revised, because Google recognizes this. Google knows back from back in the day, in the pre-spelling era, if I type in, uh, what shall I do? Galileo with two O's, right? Galileo. That's not going to be a common one. But if instead, right, I click on this and I say, yeah, this is definitely what I mean, in a sense, that's revising my query, right? If I accept that, for all practical purposes, I have revised my query to admit, oh, I'm looking for this. And then Google says, aha, Galileo is, we have evidence that this is a misspelling of Galileo. Okay. When somebody puts in a candidate a search term that has a low query rank, right, it's not common and it's similar to a highly ranked query, then Google looks at it and says, yeah, you know what, there's a good chance this is a misspelling. And the similarity could be in individual words, could be semantic units, could also be observed from sequential searches, right? If you type in something and it's wrong, it gives you a bunch of wrong data and you jump back and do something else, right? For example, if I do this, if I type in UIC, but then I say, oh, no, that's what I meant. I meant ICU, right? They say, oh, maybe this one thing is a misspelling for the other thing. Okay, Google starts to learn stuff like that. And one of the fun things you can have with Google is trying to figure out how badly you can spell things and still get reasonably good search results. So, for example, uh, and one of the things that works well is if you, like, start off with the first part of the term, like, univer, uh, sorry, univer, uh, of Illinois at Chicago. Ah, see? The old Google could not have done that. The old Google would have just looked at this and said, 
what the hell, I don't know what these words are, right? Modern Google can say, well, you know what, I'm going to make a best guess that this is what you mean. And in fact, if I tweak this just a little bit, let's get rid of that S. We do that, and it's going to give us University of Illinois at Chicago eventually. Did I break it? Where, how long did that take? Oh, I didn't get my search. I, that felt like a really slow search, though. Took a little while. Spelling check ones do take a little longer. But yeah, UIC, I can, I can get that from this, you know, horrible set of garbage words. Okay. Okay. I'll go back for just a second here. Uh, so we were to understand how spelling servers work. I mean, that's, that's their function. They get the original queries, they identify misspellings, and basically they return a list of likely options. So if, you know, the query comes in that's misspelled, like university, blah, 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 it's gonna recognize, hey, you probably misspelled that, and it's going to return back to the regular search query system. It's gonna say, oh, you probably meant University of Illinois at Chicago. That was the best thing of what we got. Now, back in the day, you might still see one of these around. They had something called a Google Search Appliance. And a Google Search Appliance was basically like a little box, kind of looked like a little server, uh, and it was document storage. So if you were a business, you could store, you know, tens of millions of documents, potentially. And why it was really important, you can imagine that business documents made in the real world, people often misspell things, right? And if you're looking through a bunch of documents, trying to find something that matched certain terms, and you miss someone, something because of a misspelling, it can be very difficult to find that thing again. So that's a big part of making that technology uh, useful. However, right, these things, are, they still exist, they're still out there, but Google doesn't really support them anymore. So if you have one, you can still use it, but yeah, they're kind of gone. Okay, they've uh, shifted to trying to sell cloud storage instead. Okay. All right, last thing. Remember we talked about caffeine, about how uh, Google was able to do the updates in real time much faster, right? Back in the day, they used to do them in batches at the end of the day, but now they can do it essentially in real time. Well, reason why, number one, as far as Google users are concerned, all the pages, all the search results, they're read only, okay? You just, that, that's what you get. The users can't change anything. They can only see what's there. Second, with systems like Bigtable and these others, it's designed to let you do small scale updates very quickly, right? So there'll be some group of pages that are together. If those get updated, for example, right? Like in our Chicago Cubs example here. If I'm already storing groups of pages that are searched together, if I'm already grouping those together, then I know that making the change to update all those pages is also gonna happen pretty quick. The searching for them is quick. The reading them is quick, but writing to them is also quick because I can blurp, do them all in a quick sequence, right? And they're all compact and grouped together, and I can do these three small segments without affecting this entire giant chunk of the system. Okay, so that's part of it. Last, duplicate copies are always maintained locally. So even if I'm changing one or two of the copies of a page, there's always going to be at least one of them available for somebody to read off of. But the other thing, is that like uh, Facebook, Google has adopted a lot of eventual consistency uh, policies as far as search results. So what this can mean, different users might receive slightly different search results, especially if they're using different data centers. So if, for example, one data center might have updated uh, its particular version of a page while another data center, center hasn't quite done it yet. So for a few seconds, there might be that sort of gap. And in a read-only system, right, where they're not managing transactions through this, they don't have that kind of, you know, people stealing Bitcoin problem. But since imperfection is expected and it's read-only, people can live with that, right? People using Google do not expect to get absolutely perfect results. They expect to say, well, as long as the results I want are in the top 10 and probably the top five, yeah, that's pretty good and I can live with that, right? So if items number 16 and 17 are out of order or items number 98 and 99 are out of order, it's not really gonna affect users' experience at all. Anyway, perfect database consistency would just slow down the results too much, especially at Google scale. So basically they made this trade-off. They're not gonna to hold to these asset properties everywhere at all their different data centers because anytime you change one in data, copy in a data center, everything has to be on hold while that changes. Instead, they say, yeah, 
we're going to change them and there might be a little gap of a few seconds here or there where people get different results and we can live with that that's a corner we're going to cut okay i feel like we have covered enough any questions on any of this stuff we covered a lot of material nothing nothing all right well